Good morning. Welcome to Truth in the Streets. I'm Reverend Amy Bauman with For His Glory Ministry, and I am so glad that you're choosing to join us today. I love this time that we can spend together as a body of believers from all over the world. We do church every Sunday online. And I am hearing uh, bits and pieces uh, from messaging and emails and comments of uh, what you're getting out of these services. And I am so blessed. All glory to God. Everything that God is doing around the world and how he's growing the ministry. And so thank you. Thank you for sending those comments and your kind words. And I pray that if this is your first time joining us today, that it will be a blessing, that you will feel the presence of God wherever you're watching from, and that he will open up your heart for what it is that we're going to be talking about today. And I have a lot to share with you. Wednesday is not only Valentine's Day, but it's the start of Lent. And so we're going to be looking at that today, understanding temptation and what Jesus experienced in the wilderness. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 4. But before we get started, let's open with prayer. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity for us to come together as community, as, as church online. And church is not a building, Lord, it's the people. And I just pray that even though we're scattered across the world, that we represent you, Jesus, in a loving and kind way, and we're staying involved and tuning in because we want to be more like you. And so, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you will open up our hearts and our ears today, that these words will be for each one of us, and I pray for a fresh anointing that I will speak your truth with love. I cannot do this without you. We thank you for everything that you are going to do, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, maybe Lent is new to you. Ash Wednesday is new to you. Maybe you've never even heard it before. So, why do we have Lent? Why do we celebrate it? Why do we have Ash Wednesday and then have uh, this Lent period up until the time of Easter? Well, for those of you that don't know, or maybe this is going to be a great refresher for you, Lent is a 40-day season of prayer and fasting and almsgiving that begins on Ash Wednesday and ends at sundown on Holy Thursday. Good Friday, as we read and we celebrate that uh, Jesus was crucified on the cross, and then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, he rose again. From the dead. Now, many say that Lent mirrors that 40 day of Jesus spending time in the wilderness. 40 days in the wilderness, and as we read it, we see that he is resisting Satan's temptations. And in honor of this, many Christians will deny themselves something that they love, maybe uh, something that tempts them. They'll deny themselves and offer it up as an offering during those 40 days from Ash Wednesday to Holy Saturday or um, Holy Thursday. Everybody does it a little bit different. People give up food or vices or maybe like watching too much TV. Some people give up coffee. Some people give up social media. Something that maybe you love to do, you're saying, I'm willing to give this up as an offering, as a fast, to allow the Lord to do something new in me. We also see parallels as Jesus spent 40 days suffering in the wilderness, and so did the Israelites spend 40 years in exile, preparing, God was preparing them to go into the promised land. Some say that Jesus redeemed that because they were not able to fulfill that Jesus does in that 40 days. But if we were to look at the Bible and what does the Bible show us, 
then Lent begins in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit guides Jesus into the wilderness. We pick that up and read about that in Matthew chapter 3, that Jesus comes out. John the Baptist says, here he is. I'm not worthy to touch his sandals. Jesus asks John to baptize him. And we read about how Jesus came up out of the water and um, the Holy Spirit descended and God's voice, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And from there, Jesus goes right off into the wilderness. And he is face to face with temptation and struggle. And it is during this time that Jesus is formed and shaped for ministry and the journey that he needs to take to the cross. So as we're coming into this season of Lent, I think it's important to understand a few things about this story and how it can apply to our lives and how it does apply to our lives if we will let it. Now, I've shared with you before that I was raised in the church, but after my parents' divorce, everything kind of stopped and halted for that. We were very involved for several years in my growing up years, but after that, for me, teenage years, not so much. I wasn't involved like I was when I was younger. So I had things that I was missing out on gaps in my knowledge about the Lord. And truly my first season of observing Lent was back in 2013. I went to my very first Ash Wednesday service and learned as I sat there that the season of Lent was designed to evaluate areas of your life where you're thirsting for God where you need him to come in and break through. And as I sat there in the pew, reflecting on the pastor's words, I realized that I have been struggling in my marriage. I realized that we were not doing each other any good service. I realized the part that I was playing in that. And I spent the next two weeks realizing that as I was trying to live out, you know, each and every day, I was filled with bitterness and resentment towards him, towards God, towards how things were turning out. This is in my second marriage, mind you. This is in the marriage that I, of the man I'm married to right now. And I could no longer push those feelings aside. It was literally choking out the love. And I was angry all the time. And I was filled with bitterness and resentment. However, through prayer, I was able to see the areas that I needed to change internally how God needed to break in and work and move in my life, which in turn changed my marriage. You see, it wasn't all his fault. And I think sometimes we get to that hard place in our life and our blame goes on the other person and we think, not me, it's not my fault, I'm not doing anything, it's all them. But that wasn't the case. Yes, he was, you know, he was in it. He was in the relationship with me. We were both doing things that weren't loving but there was a huge part of it that i needed to take responsibility for that was me and since that time in 2013 understanding have a better understanding of lent and how we can use that space for god to come in and show us the journey we need to take to get to the cross i've used it since then i've embraced it and it's a great time to reflect on my life and how I can grow closer to God. 
yes, we should use that all the time, but here's a specific season, right? Designated, taking us to the cross that we can examine our feelings, examine where we're at, do a check-in, see how we're doing as we prepare for that ultimate celebration of, of what Jesus did for us, our salvation. When we look at Jesus' life, he fasted, prayed, and endured temptation from the enemy to strengthen himself for the journey that he was about to take. That's how he prepared. And I think we can look at this story and gain so much of our walk by reading what Jesus did. If we're to look at Jesus' life, how can we take some of that, all of that, and apply it to our own journey? So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading uh, chapter 4 today and see his 40 days in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. As I was studying and preparing for today's sermon, I looked up one of my favorite commentaries, Enduring Word, by David Gusick, and I wrote down these points that he made, which are extremely valuable as we look at this story. As As it starts out, we've recognized, right, we talked about how Jesus was baptized and then went into the desert, into the wilderness. So there's this remarkable contrast between the glory following Jesus' baptism and the challenge to be tempted by the devil. And there's these things that we can reflect on. And, and examine. First you have the cool waters of the Jordan and now you have the dry barren wilderness. First you have huge crowds that were standing around listening to John the Baptist and then seeing Jesus be baptized and now there's solitude and silence. First the spirit rests like a dove, right? And now the Spirit drives him out into the wilderness. First there was rest and peace, and now there's forward motion. We have the contrast of the voice of the Father calling him beloved Son in whom he is well pleased. And now we have the hiss of Satan, the tempter. First he is anointed, and now he is attacked. First the water of baptism, and now the fire of temptation. First the heavens opened, and now he is facing 
hell itself. Sometimes I think we get caught up in the trials of living in this world and we say, God, you don't understand. You do not understand what I'm going through right now. Have you forgotten me? Do you not love me? And, and I think that we <laughs> camp there, right? We camp there and, and get bitter and uh, get resentful. I've done that. And yet this story, what we're reading today, is an example of Jesus enduring the same things that we endure here in this world. The highs and lows, the water and the desert, the, the plenty and the nothing. He goes through each one of these things that I just pointed out. And how can we stand here today and say that Jesus does not understand when he understands all too well what we go through? And, the, and you see, for Jesus, he did not need to be tempted to help him grow. Instead, he endured the temptation both so that he could identify with us and to demonstrate his own holy, sinless character. We need things like struggles to help us grow because in our flesh, Man, we love the easy road. We want the good easy all the time. We could just bump along and be happy with the easy life. And when we do that, there is no growth. There is no momentum forward. And a lot of times when the Lord is trying to use a situation to grow us to be more like him, we sit down and we get angry and bitter and resentful and we say, not going any further. This is ridiculous. And yet, Jesus shows us how to walk that out and to keep going. He identifies with us. And he shows us that he was sinless and obedient to the Father. And when we have Jesus in us, he can help us do that exact same thing. But we got to be willing to go through those challenging seasons and allow the Lord to show us what he wants to when we do. It's also important to point out that the Holy Spirit cannot tempt us, but the Holy Spirit may lead us to a place where we will be tempted this is not to prove something to God, but to prove something to us and to those watching us. Sometimes God uses you and your experience because someone else is watching. And maybe that's the only way that God can move them is by moving you. God works all things for his glory, all things. And he knows best, and we need to trust him in that. I also think it's important to point out that if Jesus was tempted by the devil, and I think I said this last week, Temptation is certainly for everyone. If the enemy is going to come here and tempt the Son of Man, Jesus, God's only Son, you can bet that He is going to tempt you, that He's going to try to trip you up, that He's going to try to meet you in the desert of your life and give you struggles and give you temptation and tempt you. Yet Jesus' temptation was more severe, more severe than what we face. It was more severe because he was tempted directly by the devil himself. While we typically on a daily basis contend with those minions, 
those fallen angels, those lesser demons. It was also more since severe because there is a sense in which temptation is relieved by giving in and Jesus never yielded. Therefore, he bore levels of temptation we will never know by experience. I know that there have been things that have been put before me that I followed through on. And Jesus, Jesus never yielded. We have a hard time yielding. However, we can yield. We can not yield because of Jesus. He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and afterward he was hungry. Oh my word, I think about me going a a day without a meal and maybe just some water and that I would be so hungry. And there are people out there today that go one to three days without a meal. Matthew points out both the barren desert, which is the Judean desert, wilderness and Jesus's severe physical condition after such a long fast. I've been in the Negev desert. It's hot. It's dry. You want water. You want the shade. You want to leave. And here Jesus was out here 40 days and it was said that He was hungry. It indicates the subject, Jesus, is beginning to starve. And this is when the devil came. It's also important to point out that 40 days and 40 nights, again, I talked about that with the Israelites walking around in the desert, waiting to get into the promised land both also though in the days of Noah however Jesus succeeds where Israel as a nation failed and when we look at God's word when we look at the life of Jesus we can say I can have victory when Jesus is living in me I can have victory to overcome because of Jesus. So let's take a a minute and break down the three temptations because they were specific. They show specific things in how the enemy will come at us. The first temptation was an appeal to the flesh. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He was hungry and the enemy came to tempt him in the flesh. That says a lot of things for us. We need to know our temples. We need to know our struggles. We need to know when we've had enough. I have learned and realized that having a very deep, meaningful conversation with my husband cannot happen at nine o'clock at night. I'm tired. I'm ready for bed. I might say things that I wouldn't ordinarily say. It is not good for me to have a conversation with him that late at night. It's not good for him either. And I've gone to him at the end of the day, right before I'm going to climb into bed and want to have this big conversation about something that was said earlier and neither one of us in our place to do that. I also know that when I get hungry, that's not a good time to make decisions. That's not a good time for me to have this deep conversation also. We have to know ourselves. 
the devil does. The devil knows exactly what your different strengths and weaknesses are and when is a perfect time to come and have a battle with you. But we have to know that also. We have to know that so that we can take care of those things, that we can say, you know what, let's table this for tomorrow. Or how about I got to get something to eat first and then let's sit down. We need to know. And if you remember reading that, Matthew doesn't write when the tempter came. He does, sorry. Matthew writes, when the tempter came. So it's not a question of if he will come, but when he will come. And we will face temptation just like Jesus. The devil also said, if you are the son of God. Truly, this question could have been framed a little differently, more like, since you are the Son of God. Satan did not question Jesus' deity. He knew he was the Son of God. He challenged him to prove it. He challenged him to prove it through miraculous works. Jesus could have stood against Satan with a display of his own glory. I mean, he's Jesus. He could have stood against Satan with logic and reason. But instead, Jesus used the word of God as a weapon against Satan and temptation. And we can do that as well. He used a weapon that one can use when they are all alone. And that's oftentimes when the devil wants to come. He used a weapon to defend his sonship and who he was. He used a weapon to defeat temptation. He used a weapon that was effective because he understood it. He knows God's word. we then can effectively resist temptation in the same way Jesus did, by countering Satan's lies, by shining God's light of truth upon them. And if we are ignorant of God's truth, then we are poorly armed in the fight against temptation. We just came off of that January series, The Fundamentals of Faith, and we understand the importance of knowing God's Word. That's our true north. That's our truth. That's the foundation that we stand upon. But we also talked about knowing our enemy and that the enemy will come at us. And yet God has given us his full armor and he's given us his truth his word, so that we can stand against the enemy and fight. And it's not only something that we can do. We see this is exactly what Jesus did in God's word. And that is how we too are supposed to fight. So the first temptation was against the flesh. Now, the second temptation is an appeal to the pride of, of life. How many of you have pride today? For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. This is amazing. This time around, the devil uses the word of God back at Jesus. So if, if you're wondering sometimes, man, I, I heard this, but it sounds exactly like um, God's word, yet it's twisted. The devil knows God's word also. Satan borrowed our Lord's weapon and said, it is written, but he did not use the sword lawfully. It was not in the nature of the false fiend to quote it correctly. 
he left out the necessary words in all thy ways. Thus he made the promise say what in truth is never suggested. Charles Spurgeon wrote that. He leaves pieces out. He doesn't share the whole word. He'll use whatever means necessary to get to you. And in this case, he turns right around and uses God's word against Jesus. But Jesus reminds him what the whole thing means. And he untwists Satan's words. So we have an appeal against the flesh, an appeal against pride. The third temptation is an appeal to the lust of the eyes. He promised his world, kingdoms of this world and their glory, if Jesus would just bow down and worship him. I will give you all of this, all that your eyes can see, if you will just bow down and worship me. And it is in this moment that Jesus replies, Away from me, Satan, for it is written. Jesus replied with scripture again and commanded the devil to leave. And this, my friends, is what we need to do each and every time the enemy comes at us with some kind of temptation. It worked for Jesus. And then the devil left him. And it is going to work for us. It will work for us, but we need to implement it into our lives. We need to use God's word as that weapon. We need to recognize the battle. The devil leaves and angels come to administer to Jesus. And the devil left him. And that means that Jesus won. He won because he recognized Satan's mode of attack. He won that battle because the enemy left. He won because he had not fallen into temptation. He won because he was faithful to God. And I think we have a hard time understanding that sometimes when the enemy comes to us and we have the battle that we start to doubt. Well, maybe I'm not, I, I'm not a strong enough believer or maybe somehow I've done something wrong. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. Jesus had been led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and the enemy came to him. I think it's important to remember that in this world, we are going to battle the enemy and it doesn't mean that we've done something wrong to bring him over. That's something he wants us to believe. He wants, us to fi he wants to find a way that he can get at us. He wants to make us feel guilty. He wants us to make us feel overwhelmed. He wants us to start questioning our relationship with God. And yet Jesus didn't do any of that. The enemy came. Jesus didn't throw a huge tissy fit in the middle of the wilderness. No, Jesus stood his ground and each time the enemy came at him, he said, it is written. And he said finally for him to, to go, get away from me. And we can do it that exact same way. It doesn't need to be this huge drama, this huge ordeal. This is just us rebuking the enemy in our everyday lives and saying, Get away from me. I'm not going to listen to you. This is what God's word says. There's a couple ways that we can be challenged, I think. First and foremost is if we're not even aware of the battle. And secondly, 
if we read too much into it. If all of a sudden we start thinking and, and overthinking and, and looking at things. And I think this text is a prime example that Jesus didn't do anything except was led into the wilderness. And this is us, right? Just walking out our lives. But I think it's important for us to take a moment and say, are we walking out our lives? Are we walking out our faith? Are we doing everything that we're supposed to be doing that Jesus is calling us to do? We don't want open doors where the enemy can come in freely because of something that we are doing in our life, that we're struggling with, that we are letting the temptations take us over. Then the enemy is winning. This is a prime example of Jesus winning, of Jesus living a sinless life, being obedient to his father still having the battle and winning using God's word. So as we come into this season, what do you need to do to focus on Jesus and what he wants to do in your life? Maybe you are like me that day in church back in 2013 when I sat there and was just like, oh my word, what's happening in my life right now? Maybe you need to have a really big shift. You need to totally switch and go the other way to be looking at Jesus. Maybe this is a small, a small adjustment that you need to make, but whatever adjustment is that you need to make in your life, what do you need to do over these next 40 days to keep your eyes on Jesus. Yes, we can give something up. Fasting allows us to give up something we like or love so that when we miss it, in that time when we're missing it, we can be praying and thanking God and asking him to show us. It's one less thing that we're thinking about or using in our lives that could distract us. So it's helpful, right? It is helpful. But the whole point of doing it is so that we can be praying to God and asking him to show us what he wants to show us. And it doesn't have to be that you're fasting from coffee or fasting from social media, or fasting from TV or a movie. What could we be fasting from this season? Pope Francis said these words. Do you want to fast this Lent? Fast from hurting words, and say kind words. Fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Fast from worries and trust in God. Fast from complaints and contemplate simplicity. Fast from pressures and be prayerful. Fast from bitterness and fill your heart with joy. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate to others. Fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words and be silent so you can listen. Those last two words, do you know that silent and listen are spelled with the exact same letters? 
And it's important, right, that the only way that we can really listen is to be silent. Creating a space where we're not talking, where we're not listening to music, where we're not on our phones, but that we can really listen to what the Lord has to say to us. Remember, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. It's about having a space to learn about Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, in that relationship where we can see them, hear them, love them, worship them, live like them. Jesus came to earth and so many times he says that you have seen the Father because you have seen me. And so if we want to know who God is and and how compassionate and caring he is, all we have to do is look to the Son. All we have to do is look to Jesus. And if we want to know how to live out this life in this world with this brokenness, with these struggles, all we have to do is look up and look to Jesus. He is going to show us how to take one step at a time, walking it out each and every day. My prayer today, after this message, is that you will remember that Jesus was tempted by the enemy. And that means we will too. But because of Jesus, because of what he endured, because he led a sinless life, because he was able to make his way through that 40 days of desert and wilderness and temptation and come out the other side, never failing, because he was a sinless man, a perfect offering, a perfect sacrifice for our sins. He showed us how to fight and want to use God's word. And when Jesus is living in us, we can be victorious over every single situation and temptation that comes our way. Every single one. We can do it. Because he faced temptation and with God's help, just like us, we too can overcome. But we can't do it in our own strength. We need Jesus. And we need to remember those words. It is written. Let that be in the forefront of your mind each and every time you are facing a battle with the enemy. Use God's words against him. Tell him to get behind me in Jesus' name and he will flee. Because of Jesus, we too can overcome. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world. And as we are coming into this new season of Lent, designed for us to reflect and make our way to the cross, I pray that we will keep our eyes open, that we will keep our ears open, that we will keep our hearts open. And Lord, if you are calling us to fast in some way, shape, or form, that we will be obedient to that. But more importantly, Lord, let us fast from these things that we are doing in our everyday lives. As Pope Francis said, let us fast from harsh words. Let us fast from cynicism. Let us be compassionate and loving. Let us do things the way you did here in this world, Jesus. Let us bring heaven to earth. Let us walk out our faith. Let us stand firm. Let us show others, especially those that don't know Jesus, what your love really does inside of us. It transforms, it renews, it restores. We can be confident of walking in this world because of you, Jesus. Because you who are in us is greater than he who is in the world. And I just pray for each person today that is struggling, that needs that encouragement, 
that they will feel your strength, that they will believe that they can overcome because of you and that you will continue to give them strength and peace as they take one step at a time holding your hand. We love you and praise you and thank you and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I pray that you have a wonderful week. I hope that you're able to enjoy Ash Wednesday. Lean into what God wants to say. Be obedient to whatever he asks as you take these steps towards the cross. But thank you so much for being here today and for joining us. And until next time, until we can be together again, be blessed.